chapter 16. The book of Revelation, for the most part, deals with a future seven-year period known as the Great Tribulation. It's a time when um, cataclysmic events will take place on the earth, but it will happen gradually. Back in the early part of our study in Revelation, uh, John the Apostle, who's receiving the vision that we call the book of the Revelation, there's a seven-sealed scroll. Uh, Jesus looses the seals, and after the seventh seal, uh, the seventh seal reveals seven trumpet judgments upon the earth. The seventh trumpet judgment, which we've already been through, uh, reveals seven bowls of God's wrath. And as you study Revelation, the seven seals and then the seven trumpets and now the seven bowls, it's an increasing intensity. God doesn't send his wrath all at once. Why is that? Because he loves people and he wants them to be saved. But in this section, things are really heating up, literally, as we'll see in the chapter. Verse 1, then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying, to the seven angels, go pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. The first angel went out, poured out his bowl on the land. And ugly and painful sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. That is the entire planet. If my calculations are correct. I mentioned last week in chapter 15, last verse, as God gives these seven angels these seven bowls, last verse of chapter 15, and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. I take that to mean no prayer is going to get through. It's a done deal. We're near the end. And now as the first bowl is poured out, on the people left, many have died. It is now universal. Interesting. Bowl number one, ugly and painful sores. Remember the plagues on Egypt? If you've been around church or Bible studies, Moses, God used this to deliver the people of Israel. He sends 10 plagues on Egypt. Egypt, biblically, is a type of the world. And it's interesting the similarities you see here in the seven bowls of wrath and some of the plagues that were sent on Egypt. For example, the first plague on Pharaoh and the Egyptians was the same plague we find here in this first bowl of God's wrath with one difference. Then it was localized. It was ancient Egypt and the Egyptians. But Egypt is a type of the world. It was prophetic of what's going to happen in this coming day that's going to be global, universal. Isaiah chapter 24 is one Old Testament prophet that tells us that no one is going to escape. Everyone is affected. It's universal. When the plague broke out on Egypt, and I think I said it was the first plague. It was the sixth plague. It's the first bowl here. It's the sixth plague on Egypt. It says Pharaoh's magicians could not stand before Moses. That's how bad it was. They called in sick. We're not going to make it in today. <laughs> Verse 3, second angel poured out his bowl on the sea. 
and it turned into blood like that of a dead man, and every living thing in the sea died. That is hard to imagine, but that's what's going to happen. The first plague on Pharaoh and the Egyptians was what? The Nile turned into blood. Uh, we live on this coast. You might have walked the beach during red tide. Red tide is nothing compared to what will happen in this coming day. Every living thing in the sea dies. Can you imagine the stench? Verse 4, the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. All the fresh water on the entire planet. You say, well, how is anyone going to survive? Uh, one of the things we note here, we are now at the end of this seven-year period known as the Great Tribulation. Things are moving in heaven. Why? Because Jesus is about to come back. Jesus, in talking about this coming day, in Matthew chapter 24, said if those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. This is the end. Now all the fresh water is defiled. The third trumpet judgment brought bitterness to a third of the fresh water, and now all the fresh water is defiled. It's really bad. But no, verse 5, then I heard the angel in charge of the water say, you are just in these judgments, you who are and who were the Holy One, because you've so judged, for they've shed the blood of your saints and prophets, and you've given them blood to drink as they deserve. And I heard the altar respond, Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. I heard the altar respond. Just a quick note. Take you all the way back to Revelation chapter 6. When the fifth seal was opened, John says, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they maintained. And they called out in a loud voice, How long, O Lord, before you avenge our blood? And the answer came back, A little longer. Until your fellow servants who will die the same martyr death that you died. Until that's complete. Well, here, it's complete. And now the judgment falls. And again, it's universal. But everything that is happening is righteous. It's holy. There's no injustice here. As we saw last week when God gives these seven angels, these seven bowls, the seven angels are dressed with golden sashes and, and clean white linen. It's a holy mission. Verse 8, the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun. And the sun was given power to scorch people with fire. You talk about global warming. <laughs> Things are really heating up, literally. They were seared by the intense heat, and, and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues. But they refused to repent and glorify him. It is so interesting to me that most of the time the term GD is used. It's in the context of a negative situation. And you've never had on the planet a more negative situation than what is happening here. And as things really heat up, and worldwide, around the globe, the sun, intense heat. Gee, it sure is hot. They're cursing God. 
because of their pains and their sores. Instead of crying out for mercy, oh, God, forgive me, it's GD this and GD that. So what's going to happen? The sixth angel poured out his bowl, verse 12, on the great river Euphrates, or I'm sorry, verse 10. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. And this one is fascinating to me. And his kingdom was plunged into darkness. Men gnawed their tongues in agony. I'm not believing they're gnawing their tongues in agony because of the darkness, but they're gnawing their tongues because... They've suffered the intense heat and the other plagues. But now, it's completely dark. They gnawed their tongues in agony, and they cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they refused to repent of what they had done. I'm going to pause just a minute on this one, not spend too much time on it, but this one is fascinating to me because it comes right after the scorching heat. Jesus said in Matthew 24, immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. The darkness here is fascinating because it was the ninth plague on Egypt. And if you've read that story or heard teaching on that story, when God sent darkness in Egypt, there was light where the Israelites were, but there was darkness where the Egyptians were, and here's what it says about the darkness. It was a darkness that could be felt. I don't know where the darkest place you've ever been was, but for me, it was on one of our trips to Israel. We've done it three times, this particular event. Three times we've walked through Hezekiah's tunnel. I love it. It's an adventure. Depending on the time of the year, uh, the level of water in Hezekiah's tunnel uh, is either higher or lower. I like it when it's a little higher because it gets you pumping a little more. And one of the things I love to do as we're deep into Hezekiah's tunnel and all you are in is just cut out rock and there is no light anywhere except hopefully the little flashlight that you brought. Or your phone flashlight. And so in my group that I'm responsible for, the the ones around me, we get right in the middle of Hezekiah's tunnel, and here's what I love to do. Okay, guys, everybody hear me? All right. Turn off your flashlight. (laughs) And it's the darkest place I've ever been. And it is a darkness that you can feel. Astronomers have observed phenomena in star suns way out where within a few days a star has increased rapidly in magnitude, which seems to be happening here in Revelation 16, the scorching heat of the sun. And within a few days, a star having increased rapidly in magnitude, then immediately after this great flare-up, dims far beneath its earlier brightness. The diminishing light of the sun causes a thickening of the clouds until little or no light can come through. That's what's going to happen in this coming day. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting light. The context of that most famous verse, the context, don't miss the context. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he's not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world. 
But men loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. And in this coming day, God says, okay, you've rejected every offer I've made, including the offer of an evangelistic angel flying around the globe telling people the gospel of Jesus Christ and giving them a chance to be saved. And here, they've made their choice, and because they love darkness instead of light, You want darkness? Here it is. Isn't it interesting? When they came to arrest Jesus, what he said to them. Here's what he said. Every day I was with you in the temple of courts. Temple courts. I I was there publicly and I was preaching and teaching publicly. And when did they come to get him? Middle of the night. And he said, but this is your hour when darkness reigns. And isn't it interesting, as he hung on the cross at the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land. For three hours, as Jesus hung on the cross, this mysterious darkness Fascinating. Jesus said, many will come in the future day and take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom, those who should have been there but missed out because they said no, will be thrown outside into the darkness where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The text is heavy. Let me just throw in a little positive, even though it's not in the text. For me and for those who have received Jesus, he's rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of light. Humanly, I I, I like the Hezekiah tunnel, turn your flashlights off, but, but I'm counting on the flashlight coming back on. I don't want to stay in the darkness. It's just a little rush, you know, <laughs> just, just a little rush. <laughs> but I don't want to stay in the darkness. Revelation 16, verse 12. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. This one's also fascinating. Uh, Euphrates is 1,780 miles long. It's an average of 30 feet deep, uh, and here it's dried up. Chapters before the sixth trumpet sounds, and God releases four angels at the river Euphrates. I, I don't know if you have that picture, but uh, last night Paige was looking at one of the pictures of the Euphrates, and I don't know if she uh, gave you, Jolie, the heads up. But if you don't have it, that's totally okay. The Euphrates. It's fascinating. Because the kings from the east, that would be on the right side of the map. Kings from the east, historically, uh, they have come time and time and time again. They are the enemies of Israel. It's interesting, the Euphrates was also an ancient boundary for the Garden of Eden. Here's paradise, and on the other side is not paradise. When the four angels are released at the sixth trumpet, John the Apostle saw an army of 200 million, 200 million. You imagine? Army of 200 million coming from the east. Just a quick reminder before we take the picture down. um, The the current countries, some of them, on the east side of the Euphrates, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, Iran, Jordan, Saudi Arabia. If you've been with us, you know that this is a coalition, an army, 
led by the Antichrist, and he's coming to invade the land of Israel. And the Euphrates is dried up so that it can come across with no hindrance. Thanks for putting up that picture. Verse 13, chapter 16, Then I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet. This is the unholy trinity. They are spirits of demons performing miraculous signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle on the great day of God Almighty. I think it's interesting that instead of just continuing the, with the narrative, you have verse 15. Here's what it says. Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him so that he may not be naked and shamefully exposed. Perk up. Wake up. And then he goes back to the narrative. And then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. I don't know if you have that picture, Jolie. It's a, the Valley of Megiddo. Been there on trips to Israel. I always get Jesus bumps when I stand and look out over the Valley of Megiddo. I can't spend too much time here, but let me give you just a little bit of information on the Valley of Megiddo, where the Battle of Armageddon will be fought. Over 200 battles have been fought there, right here, on this plain. It's where Gideon and 300 men overcame the Midianites. It's where Samson defeated the Philistines. It's where King Josiah was killed going against Necho, king of Egypt. It's where Deborah and Barak defeated Sisera. The Turks, the Muslims, the Syrians, the Egyptians, the Europeans have all waged war in this valley. Napoleon, when he's coming into Egypt, passed through this very valley. And here's what he said. If there is a place on earth where the last war must be fought, it is here. He called it the perfect battlefield. I talked to some military people in Israel about this valley, and they tell me all the reasons why it's the perfect battlefield, and it is the perfect battlefield. Thanks for that picture. The seventh angel, verse 17, poured out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, it is done. And then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since man has been on earth. <laughs> That's some earthquake. So tremendous was the quake. The great city split into three parts. I take that to be Jerusalem. The cities of the nations collapsed. There goes L.A., New York, Hong Kong, Tokyo, Dubai, Beijing, Moscow, gone. Crumble. Hard to believe, but that's what's going to happen. God remembered Babylon the Great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. Every island fled away. The mountains could not be found. At this point, Jesus is on his horse. From the sky, huge hailstones of about 100 pounds each fell upon men. You kidding me? <laughs> hailstones of 100 pounds each? <laughs> Interesting little note, too. 1950s nuclear testing in the Bikini Islands, surprising results they didn't expect. You know what it was? Hailstones that formed when surrounding water shot so high into the air that it froze before returning to the earth. To earth. But a 100-pound hailstone? Really? Hailstone? Really? <laughs> what it says. Side note. Um, 
Church is gone, I believe. This seven-year period, it's not a period of grace. It's a period of grace in the sense that people are going to be saved. But we've gone back to, in my opinion, law. Because as people reject the grace of God found in Jesus Christ, what's left? You miss the grace of God, only thing you're going to have to submit to is the law. And what was the punishment for blasphemy under the law? Stoning. There's a verse in the Old Testament that God says, I've reserved the hail for times of war. And here, at the very end, hailstones from heaven as men are GDing and GDing and things are going from bad to worse to cataclysmic and yet they're cursing God and they get what they deserve. They curse God on account of the plague of hail because the plague was so terrible. Now let me survey the crowd. Nobody's asleep. That's, that's good. That's good because you know, I can put people to sleep. I'm pretty good at it. Even in a chapter like this, sometimes I see people you know, nodding off. You know, I, I get it. I understand. I understand. And, and one, of the reasons, one of the reasons is, you know, maybe I'm just not on point. You know, maybe you're you know, just having a bad morning. Uh, maybe you've been listening to me for 30 years. I understand that. It's like, there he goes again. You know, I've heard this story before. You know, I get that. I get that. But there's another reason, too. There's another reason. Because I'm going to believe, and I trust, that the majority of you, you're not really worried about this coming day. Oh, you're like me. I mean, you read it and you hear it taught again. You go, man, that's going to be awful. And you pray for people and you don't want anybody to experience what they're going to experience. You don't want anybody to go to hell and and face damnation. Uh, But you, you, you put your faith in Jesus Christ. And so, like, I know this stuff. I want other people to be saved, but I'm not worried about me. Right? And I believe that's true and that's encouraging. But I'm going to give you a surprise in closing in 10 minutes. And that's the time I have left. Whenever I read the Bible, and I hope you read the same way, whenever I read the Bible, I, I want to know uh, what it says, but, but I want God to speak to me for now. Otherwise, what's the purpose of give us this day our daily bread? What's the purpose of that? So when you're in a section in, in a normal Bible reading devotional life like Revelation 16, uh, you, you know, I want to know, what does it mean for me today? Now for me, I don't need to get saved. I'm already saved. If you've never received Jesus... It means to you, you better get saved because today's the day of salvation and you're not guaranteed tomorrow. And there's your invitation if you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But now let me go back and talk to the church. <laughs> Last nine minutes, I'm going to talk to the church. What does this mean? What's the application? What's happening here? People's hearts are hard. These are hard hearts. These are people who have heard the message. They've heard the gospel even from an angel flying around the world. God's doing everything he can do to try to get them saved. They reject. They reject repeatedly. They go back to living their lives ignoring what they've heard, and over time, their hearts become hardened. Now listen to me, church. A heart can become hardened that's never received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but listen to me, Christian. A 
Christian's heart can become hardened. In the last few minutes, I want you to consider before the Lord, has your heart become hardened? You say, where do you find that in the Bible, a Christian's heart can become hardened? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, Mark chapter 6, among, among several places. Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. Now, I only got a few minutes, so come on, stay awake, and I'll let you go. Come on, come on, Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. Tremendous feeding of thousands as Jesus miraculously multiplies bread and fish. He does it on two occasions, and, and this is one of them. And then right after that, he has his disciples get into the boat. And uh, another storm, he's up on the mountain praying. They don't see him, but he sees them, and he's coming to them. Now, in the middle of the night, the darkness, and he's uh, verse 48, chapter 6 of Mark's gospel. Mark chapter 6, verse 48. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. About the fourth watch of the night, he went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost, so they cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it's me. Don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves, the loaves, the multiplication. For their hearts were hardened. That's what it says. What? Their hearts are not hardened in that they've rejected Christ. No, they followed Christ. They left everything to follow Christ. They, they are disciples. They are saved. But their hearts were hardened. I went to Hebrews chapter 3, and I can't turn there because, again, I've only got six minutes now. But three times in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4, it says, Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Today, if you hear his voice. I went back to those scriptures this morning, and I wrote down three things beside each one. The context of each one. And the first, the, first, the context is there's no consistency in their lives. The second, they are deceived by sin, whether it's the deceitfulness of wealth or earthly glory or things that money can buy. Oh, I said that one well. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And the third context, context of Hebrews 4, today if you hear his voice, is just outright disobedience. And I went back and I thought, that's a pattern. First, there's no consistency in their lives. They're deceived and they're buying into the things of this world instead of the things of heaven. And in time, in time, over time, they become absolutely disobedient. I've been a pastor a long time. I've seen it happen. I've seen the pattern. You know how you get a hard heart? Well, as someone who doesn't know Christ, you get a hard heart by God speaking, offering you salvation. You say, I'm not ready. Not ready right now. I've got some things I want to do. And you keep putting it off. And every time you put it off, you get a little layer. Every time you put it off, you get another layer. So that you can get to the point, if you continually reject, continually reject, and then you go back to living your life the way you want to live it, and you can sit, and you can hear the message, and you can hear the gospel, and you become callous. And the point is the same as it was when you first heard God's voice. But now you're callous. The same thing can happen to a Christian. That's why James tells the Christian, <laughs> don't be deceived. Don't deceive yourself. When you hear the word, do what it says. And what can happen to the Christian and even the person that's really saved, they're really saved, but they're not growing. That's the point of Mark chapter 6 and verses like that. You find a Christian that's not growing, learning from the past, hearing the rebuke of the Lord. Don't you get it yet? I multiplied the fish. I multiplied the bread. I can take care of you. I can meet all your physical needs. And listen, any storm of life, I'm going to be there. I'm going to take care of you. And if you're not growing and learning, 
your heart becomes hard. And you can sit in church, <laughs> and you can be the blue ribbon church attender, and yet God's not able to get through. His word is callous. He's saying the same thing he said time and time again, but because you've not done anything about it. You become hard. Hebrews 3 and 4 tells us we ought to encourage one another daily. I hope you take my public preaching and teaching words in this chapter as an encouragement. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, I realize, we realize the heart is deceptively wicked and beyond cure. But thank you for that promise and our hope that you search our hearts. Thank you for Hebrews 4 that your word is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It goes down deep and it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. I pray for anyone here physically with us in the service. I pray, Lord, for anyone watching by live stream that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior. May they surrender their lives to you today. I pray for Christians. I pray for your church. I pray for myself. And Lord, I pray for those who are still sensitive, that they would remain sensitive to the Holy Spirit, and to your word. And then finally, I pray for those that have developed or are developing calluses, that they begin to take the steps to do what you say, to respond. And then as they do, it open their eyes, open their ears, soften their hearts. May they grow and mature and become real disciples for Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for that privilege to be yours and to hear your voice and to follow you daily. Guide us. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace and give you peace and give you peace forever and give you peace and give you peace, and give you peace forever. God bless you. Have a Jesus-filled day. Amen.